know a lot of you are intimidated by approaching the press, so I actually went with a non-threatening blue color, but you can't really see it, so be threatened. Um, so yeah, I am Tim. I've been working at Games on Net uh, as the editor for about nine months now, um, and before that I was a freelancer working full-time for about a year. Um, so you can email me if you like, there are all my details, or shriek at me on Twitter. Um, if you want to download the slideshow later, I put it here um, at timcobble.com slash this URL. Um, so you can look at it there, or perhaps I can get the kind folks at Let's Make Games to host it for me. I'm sure we can work something out. Anyway, um, so the first part of talking to the press, and you'll know, forgive me for starting off on a harsh note, is do you actually have something to say? Um, because if you don't, why are you talking? And I don't mean that in a nasty way, but do not email out a press release when you have a tiny meaningless update, or you know, there's a new patch that doesn't really solve anything, or you've just released one new screenshot, but it's embargoed for a month. Um, don't do that, you know. Um, give me a big fact to work with. Like, you need a news hook. Oh, I'm sorry, a news hook is something that we look at a press release and we go, OK, that's why I can turn to news. So we need something like, you know, X has shipped 6 million units, or, you know, my game no longer causes cancer in landscape mode. So something like that. Um, let's talk about me for a while. Games on Net is a gaming portal for internet and iNet customers. Um, we do 120,000 unique Australian visitors, visitors a week. Uh, we have 106,000 forum members, and we're PC gaming elitists. And the reason I tell you this is because the second most important part of any press release is actually researching your audience. So, does the site you're writing to actually even care about your game? That's the most important part. So, before you go and write to any site, don't just get a list of everyone who you know is a news journalist and write to them because it won't work. Um, go to the site, check out recent articles, check out the forum threads, check out the comments section. What are people interested in? Um, are they going to care about your sort of game? For example, uh, I got an email a couple of months ago where somebody asked if they could post guides on how to paint fingernails in video game-like patterns on my website, um, which is great and showed a lot of initiative and they were actually pretty well painted and very well detailed. Uh, in the photos that I was sent, but it's not really something that my PC gaming, you know, Battlefield 3 loving audience really cares about, so I had to gently turn them down. So if you find yourself in a position where you're just mass mailing out to everyone and you haven't actually taken the time to check if they're going to read your email, you're literally wasting your time. Um, so don't do that. Um, we also have people who regularly email us with the prices of manhole covers manufactured in China. I don't know why this happens, um, but we get about two to three emails a week from a company that manufactures sewer covers in China. So don't be that guy. Um, the second most important part of researching your audience is who is actually running the site. So for example, me in this case. Um, if you can personally address your letter or press release to someone, it's infinitely more compelling than just saying, dear games media, I have a new thing that is very cool and you should look at it. So take the time to check out the site's you know, comment threads, uh, forum posts, on Twitter, on Facebook, see who is actually running the site. You know, be a creepy stalker. This actually works. It's the only time you get to do it, and it's totally legitimate business strategy. So you know, find my Twitter handle or the Twitter handle of the IGN editor or whatever, and talk to them directly if you can. They'll probably check it because they only use it generally for social media stuff. So when someone comes up saying, hey, you're that IGN guy. You know, how about this sweet new game that I've got? You can play it. Here's a copy. It's very exciting to them, and you know, then they're probably more likely to write about it. If you get a personal email, you're more likely to act on it, rather than just saying, oh, OK, I bet 12,000 other people got this email. How compelling. Um, that is the most important thing. If you can open your press release with, dear Tim, I will probably pay a lot more attention to it than having to sort through my press releases folder. It's in the way that you say it. Um, Caps Lock is not your friend. So when you've got your press release ready to go, and you think, I'm going to put it all in caps lock, and everyone's going to pay attention to me, and it's going to be really cool, and they'll think it's really important because it's all in caps lock. You're wrong. And now I hate you. Um, and I've skipped over your press release. This happens all the time. A lot of people put entire press releases in caps lock. Don't be that guy. Uh, I can't really stress this enough. Um, use a spell checker. Uh, it's very basic and will save you a lot of time and make you a little more professional. Do not misspell the name of your own game and to not be inconsistent with dates, facts, or names. Um, I had a press release recently where the release date was three different dates inside the email. I'm sorry, Lucy, if you're reading this. Um, but yes, uh, 
we need that information to be accurate because we want to go to print or to the internet as fast as possible. So if you get this sort of stuff wrong, then we have to check it with you and you don't reply until a couple of hours later and so on and so forth. And you know, maybe you've missed the boat. So just take the time to do a spell check and check that you're consistent with all your dates. Keep it short. Most people won't read a press release longer than two paragraphs. This isn't because we have brain damage or something. We're just really busy. Um, I get about 200 emails a day through the Internode um, press release list. And 75% of them are actual spam about manhole covers. And the other 25% are actually interesting stuff. So if I get one that's 12 paragraphs long, I'm going to read maybe the first few sentences and then go, nope. Or if I get one that's 30 paragraphs long, I'm just going to ignore it entirely because I'm too busy. And, everyone, and I'm just a small fry. I think that's the important point here. When I say I'm too busy, what I mean is people who work at IGN or GameSpot or something, they're even busier. They don't have any time at all. They have people who probably sort through this stuff for them. Um, so when I say I'm busy, it's actually not that busy at all. It's a really tough world, and there are a lot of voices out there shrieking for attention. So if you write a huge essay to try and get that attention, no one will read it. Keep it short. Put your most exciting, unique thing in the very first sentence. I can't stress that enough, because that's the first thing we read. And if we read it and we think, oh, um, that's not very interesting at all, we're going to skip the whole press release. That seems pretty self-explanatory, but a lot of people open with really fluffy things that don't actually make any sense or relate to a storyline or aren't actually a unique news hook we can use. So open with the most exciting thing straight away. Uh, don't be an asshole. This probably doesn't apply to a lot of you because you're all indies and quite frankly you can't afford to be assholes because no one will cover you then. But when you make it big, and you will make it big because you're all really cool, don't be an asshole. Do not ever demand or expect coverage, or do not write back 20 minutes later after you send an email and say, where is my article? That's not cool, and nobody likes it. And they probably won't read it either. Um, do not, under any circumstances, say things like, can we get this online today, please? That's really not very cool at all either, and you're probably just going to be ignored. So, you know, if you remember this when you make it big, you'll continue to be loved by the press, rather than people just rolling their eyes when another press release comes in. Um, instead, be funny. So if you can make me laugh when I read your press release, I'll feel good. <laughs> That's what I look like when I laugh. Isn't it terrifying? Um, and then I will associate that good feeling with your game. So you can manipulate me with biochemistry. Isn't that fascinating? So be funny. Take the time to think about it and you know, write a good upbeat press release that is pretty funny. Then I'll go, oh, that game, that was a funny press release I read. Yeah, I'll write about that. That happens all the time. It is also about what you say, not just how you say it. Some words to avoid. Innovative. Uh, one of my personal favorite writers, Tom Francis, said recently that no one has ever read a developer describing the game as innovative and thought, wow, that sounds innovative. We have read developers describing the game as innovative and thought, wow, he sounds like a tool. This is really good advice. Do not use the word innovative. Let someone else say that your game is innovative, then it's fine. Uh, game changing and revolutionary, basically along the same lines. Deep, uh, touching, or artistic. You might be tempted to write this um, because a lot of indie games are able to use a lot of themes that big games can't, um, such as To the Moon, for example, which is quite compelling and emotional and is actually deep, touching, and artistic. But if you write that in your own press release, you sound like a twat. So don't do it. Let someone else say it for you. Uh, if the word revenge features in your storyline at all, don't write it. Uh, speaking of which, save your story for your game. Uh, you might be tempted to put your storyline in your press release. You want to put a couple of paragraphs in there. You've written some really sweet fiction. Um, and you want to show it to the world. Don't do it. I'm not going to read it. It's too long. It will not help me understand your game. Stick to a couple of paragraphs that talk about the cool, unique things your game does. And let me discover the story for myself. So in a press release, a lot of people like to use quotes. Um, it's a fairly common thing. One of the things that you do regularly, uh, or that you see a lot regularly, is people using a quote from uh, their own company. So, you know, the VP of publishing says, wow, this game is amazing, and knocked my socks off. Really? The guy who made the game thinks it's amazing. Well, where do I sign? Nobody wants to read that. If you need to get a quote, use somebody from the press, an industry body, a critic, etc. If you don't have one of those, don't put a quote in. Don't go to your VP of marketing and get him to write about how amazing the game is and how it, you know, cured his cancer. It never works. Right? because everyone reads it and they go, oh, really? Oh, OK, what a laugh. 
Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Don't you quote yourself. There you go. Resources speak louder than words. I didn't time this. I'm probably going really fast. I hope you're all looking forward to a muffin break. Um, how can I learn more? So a press release without resources that I can use as a journalist is no press release at all. Um, you should feature at minimum a link to your website, an easy way for me to download images. Uh, a big asset zip is always really good. You can say, here are, all, here are 15 screenshots, high res in a zip. Here's a link to it. You can get them all now. Or just give me a big gallery that I can download from. And a YouTube trailer that I can embed, that very minimum, or one that I can download and host for myself. But preferably a YouTube trailer because I can do that really quickly. Um, if you have a trailer, obviously. If you don't have a trailer, then, you know. Um, anytime I have to spend searching for these on your site, and you must have a site to back this up before you go to a press with an announcement about your game, have a website with all this content on it. Anytime I have to spend searching your site for this decreases the chance of me actually writing your story, and I probably moved on because I had to spend 20 minutes trying to download sites, download pictures from your bizarre image gallery that you've protected with some sort of weird JavaScript right-click thing, and now I'm really angry, and I'm not going to write about you. So just give me assets really quickly. It doesn't hurt you at all. In fact, it furthers your cause a lot. Um, and just get them to me as fast and conveniently as possible. And then I will use them, and I'll be very happy to use them. But don't just image dump and run. Don't just send a couple of images and don't explain them, because I don't know what I'm looking at. Um, I have no idea what I'm seeing. You know, I guess I'll just make something up. Any developer releases a new game about people standing around or something. Uh, buy it now, maybe. You know, give me some context, or at least provide a helpful file name. If you have just got a big zip file, label the files with something very helpful, like here is a combat sequence, here is the inventory screen, that sort of thing. Don't let make me guess it. Because if I want to put a caption or if I want to show a screenshot that I think is really cool, um, I'll try to write about it and I'll end up giving entirely the wrong impression to my readers. <laughs> know your game. This probably won't be a problem for you guys because you're directly making the game and also you're probably marketing it yourself. Um, but if you don't know about the game or you're just working PR for somebody else, um, and I ask you a question and you can't answer, that looks bad, and delays your coverage and could result in me missing it entirely. So if I have a question and you don't know what it is, take it to the developer straight away. Or if you are the developer, answer very quickly. So for this reason, um, and with no disrespect to Chris, be wary of outsourcing your PR. Or if you do, instruct them to immediately refer all questions back to you as the developer. Because if I write back to a company and I say, when is this new content coming out and when can I access it? And they say, um, you know, this content is revolutionary, innovative, and game-changing. It'll be out soon. I'll be like, cool, thank you, and I'll just completely skip on and never talk to that person or that game again. On the day of your press release, don't just send your email, you know, then go into the bush on a holiday for two weeks. Um, you need to be at your computer ready to answer questions very quickly because when I read your thing, and I will get around to it, if it's short and has a nice unique fact in the first two paragraphs, I'm going to have some questions probably. And if you're not there to answer them quickly, by the time the workday is finished, you might have already been skipped over. So don't just email and run. Be ready to actually answer questions very quickly. And don't email back very quickly saying, did you get my email? Where is my thing? Because that is doing it too far and going too far in the opposite direction. Just be passive, but respond to developers when they ask you, sorry, respond to journalists when they ask you questions. Taking the relationship further, unfortunately I'm happily married, but you can use this advice on any other journalist that you see fit. Uh, what does the game's journalist want? Exclusives. No, that's not a big enough text, let's try again. Exclusives. If you have something exclusive, I want it, right? Because I want to be the site with the content that nobody else has especially if your game's really popular. One of you is probably the next notch or something. And when you are the next notch, I want to be the guy that gets all the exclusives because everyone's playing your game. So if you can offer something exclusive to me that no other outlet has, if it's an interview, or some pictures, movies, even better, um, I want it. And if you say, I will give this exclusively to you or I can offer you an exclusive preview of the game, here's a preview build, that's really amazing. That's a powerful tool. The word exclusive is like a trigger phrase for a journalist, it just sends them into a frothing you know, frenzy of enjoyment. So use it frequently. Um, 
Preview builds. Offer them all the time. All the time, even if they're buggy. Um, if you say, here is a preview build of my latest game, and they come back and say it's buggy, you say, okay, I'll fix it. That's really good. Then the journalists will write, there are a few bugs in the initial release, but the developer's been really proactive about fixing them, and that makes you look like a cool guy, and the developer also gets, so the journalist in my case, gets to look like a guy who is actually talking about and being critically fair to the game by mentioning it does have some bugs. And that's okay, all games have bugs, but just be proactive about fixing them. Um, if you're using a distribution service like Desura or Steam, uh, get some keys, send them out all the time. Just offer them straight away. Don't even think about whether it's a good idea or not because the earlier people are playing your game, the better, basically, because they're going to talk about it and they're going to be interested in it and you're going to start building up the pre-release hype that you want for when the actual game comes out. So offer a current preview build in an email wherever possible. Just say, append it to the bottom of the email. If you'd like a preview build of our game, let me know. I'll get you one. Um, but now your game is finished. Well done. So do a big mail out saying that you're offering, or just flat out give review keys to people. Um, even if the guy isn't going to review it immediately, a free game is going to get downloaded and he'll play it and he might talk about it later. It doesn't have to be an initial day of launch review. It might be an interesting you know, analysis a few weeks later. It's all good. It's all publicity for you. So just hand out review keys all the time. Don't even think about it. If you can get 50, 100 from Steam or Desert, just do it. Um, a free game costs you nothing. Uh, well, it doesn't really cost you nothing, but you get a number of review codes when you sign up through a distribution service, or if you're actually distributing yourself, it costs you nothing. So just hand them out. Um, if you get a review and it's not what you hoped for, this happens. Don't get angry. Um, you can't win them all. And it looks bad for you if, it looks bad for you and for me if we have to get into an argument about it. I'm not going to say I'm going to be harsh on your review. Most reviewers are actually really fair and really nice people, especially to indies who have a certain uh, uh, generosity in terms of uh, the harshness of the critic. Because if you're an indie and you're making your first game and you're just breaking into the market, people aren't just going to slam you. They're going to be usually quite supportive and don't. But if someone does come down on you, don't just rage out and say, I actually deserved a 10 because it doesn't look good for you and the other person will get angry. And then they'll probably write about how you were angry and about how your game deserved a 10. And then the cycle continues and then you, know, you look bad and they look bad and everyone's very angry at each other and you've just lost a press contact. So don't do that. If you don't get what you hoped for, that's okay. You can't win them all. You'll probably get it on another site. Post-launch support. Um, obviously, after you've launched your game, there's going to be a few issues to deal with. Maybe it's buggy, maybe it's not. Did your game do well? Cool, it's party time. Buy yourself a beer. Thank the press people for their support. A personal email to this effect goes a long way. So write to them and say, thanks for the review. Uh, thanks for you know, helping us with the sales. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank the players and the fans for their support as well. Did your game not do too well? It's okay. Buy yourself a beer anyway. I don't shrink from the media. If your game doesn't do well, people are complaining about bugs. You know, it set their house on fire, that sort of thing. Don't just go, oh my god, and run away from the computer and throw your computer in the ocean. Because if you do that, then everyone will think that you're actually running from the problems and you validate them. If the game is buggy, release the press release immediately saying that you're working on it and promising a date or try to give an estimated date. Because this way you look proactive, the, the, the journalist can write, you know, we've talked to the developer and there is a fix coming for these bugs soon. Maybe don't buy the game right now, maybe buy it in a week. Or buy the game now and hope for the best, you know, because they're a good developer, I've worked with them before, they'll get a fix out, don't worry about it. If you just run from the problems, um, it's never going to work. And then you create a reputation where you look like the sort of person who isn't going to fix a problem when it comes up. And then no one's going to buy your products and then it's an endless cycle. So be proactive about these problems and do not run from the media. We're not actually very threatening. That's about all I had. So question time. If anyone had any questions about uh, how to approach the media or what it's like in the media or how much it costs to buy a review score of 10 from me. Uh, all these things are appropriate. Andy, sorry, you were first. Um, when you say release, um, give uh, releases early, yep. um, that's always been a question of mine is um, how early is too early? Like, do you want to give the game away, uh, you know, wrong, wrong use of the word game at the moment, but 
you want to give your ideas away too early, or because well, you're giving other developers the opportunity to release the same sort of content before you can, if they're ready to go. It depends on idea. the complexity of your game. I mean, if you were to release like you know a new AAA shooter, and no one's going to really steal your ideas and be able to replicate them. I guess if your game is really simplistic and you're really worried about the mechanic being easily copyable, it might be something to worry about. But generally, I think you have to be confident to some extent in the quality of your product, even if someone is a competitor, that you were the guy who actually had the idea and had the foresight to shape it in the way you want. Um, basically, that's a trade-off you're going to have to make. If you want that early coverage and that pre-release pre hype, you're going to have to do it, and there's no way around it. It's better to have that hype going and to be able to launch with people already looking forward to your game and maybe already put down a pre-order or bought the alpha build off you, um, like a Minecraft-style um, scenario, than to just launch and no one knows what your game is about. So I guess it is a risk in that sense, but it's a risk you have to take. If you don't take it, you'll get left behind. And if you release, when's a good time to release? Like, is it from the alpha build or like to build the community? Or oh, do you mean like in terms of calendar months, when's a good time to release? Because um, there are definitely good and bad times to release. Uh, if you're looking, it's locking you in. That is the, the concern I have. Is that you suddenly release this thing and then you're building this expectation. Um, if you perhaps you take longer than you anticipate to release, that could damage you as well. Right? I guess the thing then would be not actually mention a date unless you're really comfortable you can hit it. I mean, you don't. You're not ever beholden to anybody. You don't have any investors probably. Um, so there's nobody who's going to ride you if the game misses the release date by a month or anything. Just be the, the one thing that. You have to remember is the internet has a really long memory. So if you mention a release date, people will remember it, and then they'll remember it when you miss, and they'll keep remembering it, and you'll be the guy who missed the release date, even four games down the track. You'll be, oh, that guy, we can't rely on him. Um, so if you say something, you know, back it up. That's why politicians never comment on anything, because they have to stick to it. So you have to be the same when approaching the media. If you say, I'm going to release on August 21st, and you don't make it, then you look bad. So just don't give a release date and you'll be fine. You just say this is coming when it's finished. No one really cares. I mean, Fez just came out and that took five years to make or whatever and the guy just shut himself in a cave and finished it. Um, so there is nobody really going to care if you don't announce a date. But if you do one, if you do announce and then you miss it, then they'll care. So I hope that helps somehow. Just, uh, just are you really, is it uh, like fair to release um, information from like concept stage or wait a while and then show some concept stuff? Um, concept art doesn't really tell anything. See the previous one about I don't understand your pictures. Um, if you've got, I would say no. Concept art, no. Um, if you've just, if no one knows what your product is, concept art is meaningless. Um, if I know what a game is, if I know, for example, before Guild Wars 2 is announced, right, if ArenaNet said, here's some concept art for a game we're working on, everyone's like, oh my god, it's Guild Wars 2. And then they'll care because they already have a pre-existing expectation of what the concept art will be about. They've projected their own interest onto it and everything like that. But if you're just coming out of nowhere with a game that no one knows about and you just say, here's some concept art, it's going to be like, okay. I mean, I, I, with no offense, it won't get published. Um, it's a waste of your time. Screenshots are much better, in-game screenshots accompanied by a couple of sentences, a couple of paragraphs about how great the game is and how unique it is. But just some concept art on its own will probably not be a good idea. Oh, and calendar months, that's the thing. There are very important times to release your game if you don't want to get destroyed by AAA releases. So the end of the year is always a bad idea. Don't release anything from October to February. Just don't do it. Um, even if it's finished, wait five months and do it later. So you were next. Yeah, uh, you mentioned offering exclusives. I'm just wondering how you do that if you um, don't know if they're actually going to cover it or not. Yeah, it's something you can really... Um, basically, you would need to probably establish a bit of a rapport with the person first, just like have, if they've published a few things in the past, um, if they seem receptive to your general style of game, then you, you, know, you just wedge into that opening and crack it wide open um, and say, you know, yeah, hey, I noticed you've run five articles on my game. I'm going to offer you an exclusive preview build. That sounds pretty cool. And they'll jump. They will. Um, because... Everyone lives for traffic, and um, if they can write about what they love, which is your game, and get readers at the same time because it's an exclusive, then it's a win-win, and they're having a great time. So yeah, don't, don't just open cold with, hey, I've never met you, but how about an exclusive? It sounds like a weird spam mail. Don't do that. Chris. Uh, how, how frequently are you personally contacted by um, uh, small indie developers? Um, I think we have. Uh, a deserved reputation on games on it as being PC gaming elitists who don't really care for small time games. Um, probably about two or three times a month 
That doesn't, you know, like I, I sort of contradict myself there, but that is actually quite small. Um, again, you need to go back to knowing your audience. So if you went to say Touch Arcade or something or to Kotaku, Kotaku are really a broad spectrum, so they cover a lot of stuff, including indie games, um, then they'll be very interested. Uh, it also depends, you can work other angles. Uh, for example, if I, someone contacted me with a uh, game that was quite indie and small, might not appeal particularly well to my audience, but it's a good Australian story, like it's a good Australian developer working hard, you know, battling the big boys. Um, I'll work that angle and I will talk about it. We talked about, we try to talk about one or two Australian games a month on Games on Net. Um, we've covered Luna Fly, which just came out, and Cart Sim, and we just covered um, Brawson's new game, MacGuffin's Curse. Um, because these are, if it's relevant to the platform, so again, you research your audience, we're about PC gaming, so this game's coming out on the PC, it's made in Australia, it's going to be pretty exciting, then you'll probably get coverage. So you can work a few different angles. Um, but yeah, personally, I get about two or three months. I think places that are more receptive to indie games on multiple platforms will get a lot more. Hello. Do you have any examples of press releases which did catch your attention? Uh, I meant to do that, uh, and then I'm actually moving house at the moment, so no. Um, but um, I can't really give you any off the top of my head. But generally, yeah, the best press releases are the short ones that get straight to the point and offer something that is really cool and interesting straight away. Um, it's, it sounds you know, like I'm repeating myself, but it's a formula that's really quite easy to achieve. Um, so. I'm sorry. Maybe I can put some on the internet later. I don't know if I'm allowed to actually. I'd probably have to make them up since they're probably not something I can just copy and paste willy nilly. Anyone else? Anthony, you're a cool guy. What's wrong with using revenge to describe a story? It's the worst, most hackneyed cliche of a story ever. Yep. I'm sorry, Crisis 3, you know, just came <laughs> out. Um, if your story says one man is driven by revenge or, you know, to find the people who did it to him and get revenge or find revenge on the evil or no. Um, it's just bad. So what other kind of cliches do you end up coming across? Um, probably the second most popular cliche is the, you know, grizzled military veteran who works in a spec ops unit um, and is for some reason in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever and is totally under fire from insurgents, like, all the time. Um, and then there's, like, politics and the big boys in Washington try to totally backstab him and he totally has to fight him out. Yep. That one's pretty bad. But again, you won't see that. I mean, you guys won't write stories like that, unless you do for some reason. You probably won't. Um, as an indie developer, you have a lot of opportunity to actually write an engaging and interesting story. And it's kind of revenge in it, or maybe a spec ops guy, but these are pretty much game cliches by now. You know, we've all played a million RPGs where the kid from the village saves, you know, the world thanks to the mysterious amulet his mother gave him or whatever. Don't be that guy. You've got a lot of room to be creative as indies, and, you know, you can leverage that really heavily that other people can't. I mean, these story tropes exist for reasons because people like to read them. Um, and we like to play the game where the grizzled spec ops guy fights the big boys in Washington, but um, you don't have to be that guy. You can be better than that. Anybody else? Yes, Andy. Sorry. Um, games Press, do you guys use those? Uh, yes, we use Games Press. Sorry, do you mean the actual site Games Press? Yeah. Yes, uh, a lot of sites use Games Press to get their high res images from. Um, that works particularly well for Australian PR because due to the time zone difference, Australian PR wake up in the morning and they go to their work day and by the time they've done that, the actual images have been out for eight hours because they're released in the US or UK time. Um, so we get our stuff ahead of time from Games Press and then by the time they email us with the link, it's already been on our site for eight hours. So yes, Games Press is a very valuable resource. Um, most places use it, but you should, don't rely on it exclusively. Uh, also have a backup on your own site if you're mailing out a press release. So, you know, here's where you can get these images, here's a zip file of them all in high res. Don't just say, you can find these on Games Press. Search yourself, loser. You know, give a link, uh, preferably to Games Press and your own site, because Games Press might be down. If it's down, what are you going to do, you know? Um, but yes, Games Press is a valuable resource. And is that a good place to put, like, uh, preview builds as well? No. No, you don't, you don't want that sort of thing out in the open. Unless you, if, if you, and if you do want it out in the open, you want it from your own site so you can track it properly. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that. I would recommend giving out preview builds to people who you previously established that you have a good relationship with. I mean, even if you're offering it as the first thing, I can give you a preview build, don't just download my preview build from the internet because then that sort of thing will get out in the open. And maybe people will play that instead of the latest build and then they might write some incorrect information or something like that. You really want a, a preview build to be something that you control. You use it willy-nilly, but you actually make sure you know who it's going to. 
Where do we find people like you? Um, where, where do you start looking? Okay, so if you, I mean, it's it's if you look on the internet for games news, you know, you'll find a whole plethora of sites. Um, ours are just one of them. Um, but if you want to talk to me directly, the best way to do it is actually to go to that site and look at not only the you know generic suggest a tip or I have a, you know, I have a news suggestion button, but also to look at you know you look through the forum, look at uh, the comments section. You can probably even find them on Twitter. Like, nearly everybody is on Twitter in the games industry. Um, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter. Um, and then you can talk to them directly that way. If you're asking where can I find a big list of press, you know, uh, games press email email addresses, um, there isn't one. Um, I could certainly, you know, I'd be more willing if you contacted me directly to give people like email addresses of some of the people or point them in the direction of the people who I think would be um, appropriate for this sort of game, but you won't get that. You, there's no magic button that you can just buy all the stuff from. You have, to, you have to do the legwork and approach them individually. Chris, for example, has a lot of contacts, so if you say to Chris, you know, hey Chris, run my PR for me, he's already done the work, much the same way a real estate agent already has the, the infrastructure in place to sell a house. Um, so, you know, there is some advantage to outsourcing your PR through people like Chris because they already have those contacts. Whereas if you, as a freelancer, you want to go for yourself, you've got to do the league work. So if we get somebody like you, if I, you know, for example, if you're my PR guy, yes. or I'm sending you reviews, mm -hmm. do I just keep you exclusively as my, like my pretend one agent? Because you guys talk to each other, right? You know everyone in the biz. So, yeah, basically. So you should just stick with one guy, right? Uh, no, because then you're not maximizing your coverage at all. I mean, assuming that you email, sorry, you're talking to me as a journalist, then definitely not. Um, you know, obviously you want to treat each journalist with respect and tell them they're the only one. But basically you want to get out there and, you know, play the field. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, you're crazy not to hit up everyone, basically. You, you're crazy not to. If you just go to, like, oh, I'll just send it to Games on Net. Cool, job done. Uh, you're not going to sell anything. I mean, you'll sell a few because we're like cool cats and we got lots of people reading our site. But you won't sell as many as you could. Yeah, you're crazy not to do that. Chris? You said uh, maybe as a joke that someone in our community could be the next developer of the next Minecraft. Yep. Do you mean that seriously? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't actually know what you're making. Maybe I'll come along to your What's Up Pictures event and see. Um, but there is absolutely no reason why not because that sort of thing happens all the time. Um, but yeah, there is no reason why not. And every Every game journalist knows that, and so they have to take that chance, basically. Um, they're like, oh, you know, if, if your game's looking good and it fits all the criteria that the, the guy wants for his site, you know, it's going to make the audience happy, that sort of thing. There's a very good chance you'll be successful. And, you know, if that guy can help you with his success, then all the better you've got a sweet relationship. And, um, speaking of Minecraft, Minecraft and, and places like PC Gamer and Rock, Paper, Shock have a very good relationship because they're really chummy with each other and because in a lot of ways they helped each other to get the success um, that they wanted. Start off with, you know, these guys are like, look at this cool indie game. And then that indie game gets popular, and then that indie game's like, I remember these guys who gave me that press spotlight. I'm going to help them out with an exclusive. And then, because they got an exclusive, they get really popular. It does seem like there are a few games, like um, intro versions like that for a while. Mm. That, and Fez is another one where they're like, they're really the, the darlings of the industry. Yeah, now. yeah, there's definitely. There's, the indie scene is definitely less indie than it was, perhaps, because um, you know it doesn't mean you know poor man eating baked beans while slaving away on a game anymore. You know there can millions of dollars in indie game. There's just, I mean, not just success is ridiculous. Just for example, um, so yeah, you might, you might think occasionally, oh, I'm never going to be one of those indie darlings. But the reality is that if you don't try, you will never be one of those indie darlings. Um, so you've got to be in it to win it, basically. And at the end of the day, you're in this because you love games. So if you don't make the game, then what's the point? And if you make the game, why aren't you marketing it? You're not losing anything by marketing it. Right.